All right, guys, it is good to be back on the rock. Let me tell you what, uh, and I cannot think of a better time to climb back on my rocky pulpit than Mother's Day, Sunday, May 11th, 2014, to kick off my fifth year, my fifth year as a doomsday prophet, environmental alarmist, and the chronicler of the downfall of Western civilization, or shall I say global industrial civilization, than to get up here in early May in the middle of a dried up creek bed in a drought blasted wasteland with I guess red flag wildfire warnings in May to bring you, uh, assuming I can survive it without dying of heat stroke, my latest doomsday sermon from one of my all-time uh, great heroes on Humpty Dumpty Tribe, none other than my fellow doomsday prophet, James Lovelock, who is now 94 years old, one of the all-time uh, great doomsday prophets and environmental alarmists on the planet. I don't agree with everything this man says, but, but I do uh, appreciate this old man's moxie. Uh, he's got nothing to lose. This old man's got nothing to lose. Uh, it's spelling out for anybody on this planet who wants to understand where the hell we are going in the next hundred years, and that is straight directly into a burning lake of fire. And this is James's latest book, which completely escaped my attention until a few weeks ago. I had no idea this book even existed. The Vanishing Face of Gaia. A final warning. This is James Lovelock's, well, I don't know, he might have another one. This was his latest final warning in the year 2009, where James Lovelock, he pulls off the gloves and just hands it to everybody. Everybody from climate change deniers right on up to these little greeny environmentalists, mainstream environmentalists acting like we're going to save this planet with, with our little renewable energies uh, schemes, with our little solar panels and our, and our windmills. Pull your head out of your ass, this old man is saying, and, and hallelujah. Uh, there, 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 there is one way to, to save this planet, and that's to bring the population of this planet down where it needs to be. But uh, as the old man promises that if we don't figure out a way to bring down the population of this planet, which is what is the root cause of global warming, climate change, and every other environmental problem on this planet, Mother Nature is going to do it for us. So, I'm really not sure why this book just came out, I think it was just a couple of years early, that he wrote The Revenge of Gaia. And I didn't even realize that he'd written another one. I actually was going to go read from The Revenge of Gaia, and I found The Vanishing Face of Gaia, a final warning. Guys, I could sit here and, and just read this entire book to you. Uh, if you read any book this year, particularly about climate change, make it The Vanishing Face of Gaia by James Lovelock. I am going to split this into two sermons, probably have my second sermon in the shade. Uh, so this is a little, you know, short, sweet, little 250 page book uh, spelling out the collapse of a planet. So uh, I'm going to shut up now and just turn it over to the old man, 
James Lovelock to explain to anyone who wants to listen, including you little greeny environmentalists out there thinking you're saving the planet with your goddamn little solar panel up on your roof. Please. Okay. Let's just dive right in. Page three, I'm going to split this book into two. <clears throat> Our lives are wholly dependent upon the living earth. We could not survive for an instant on a dead planet like Mars, and we need to understand the difference. If we fail to take our planet seriously, we will be like children who take their homes for granted and never doubt that breakfast starts the day. We will not notice as we enjoy our daily lives that the cost of our neglect could soon cause the greatest tragedy in the memory of humankind, the earth in its but not our interest may be forced to move to a hot epic, one where it can survive, although in a diminished and less habitable state. If, as is likely, this happens, we will have been the cause. And Mother Earth is already trying to burn me off of my sun-blasted rocky pulpit. I'm going to dive ahead the best I can. Okay, talking about uh, the IPCC and, the, and, and these other environmentalists. Um, how can I dive in here? They fail to see the earth as alive and responsive. They ignored at our peril the extent of its, meaning our mothers here on Mother's Day, disapproval of all that we do. Talking about the central flaw in the IPCC and Al Gore's thinking. As we hold our meetings and talk of stewardship, Gaia still moves step by step toward the hot state. Yes, she does. One that will allow her to continue as the regulator, but where few of us will be alive to meet and talk. Perhaps we were celebrating because the once rather worrying voice of the IPCC now spoke comfortably of consensus and endorsed those mysterious concepts of sustainability is good and energy that renewed itself. We even thought that this way somehow, that in this way somehow, we could save the planet and grow richer as well. A more pleasing outcome than the uncomfortable truth. I am not a willing Cassandra and in the past have been publicly skeptical about doom stories. But this time around, we do have to take seriously the possibility that global heating may all but eliminate people from the earth. It may seem that my pes pessimism is an extrapolation too far. I accept this. A continued series of volcanic eruptions could reverse climate change as might one or more of the geoengineering schemes now being considered, and possibly our projections are flawed. But pessimism is justified by the difference between the forecasts of the IPCC and what observers find in the real world. Uh, the Earth's history and simple climate models based on the notion of a live and responsive Earth suggest 
that sudden change and surprise are more likely than he, what he's doing for a lot of this book is blowing the whistle on all of these IPCC climate models projecting the already dire scenario that they're projecting. He is, he is saying uh, that in his view that they are very likely not to be nearly uh, pessimistic enough. My pessimism is shared by other scientists and openly by the distinguished climate scientist James Hansen, who, who like uh, James Lovelock, is, is cheering on nuclear energy to save the planet, who finds, as I do, that the evidence now coming from the Earth, yeah, really, together with the knowledge of its history is gravely disturbing. Most of all, I am pessimistic because business and governments both appear to be accepting uncritically a belief that climate change is easily and profitably reversible. Do not expect the climate to follow the smooth path of slowly but sedately rising temperatures predicted by the IPCC where change slowly inches up and leaves plenty of time for business as usual. The real earth changes by fits and starts with spells of constancy, even slight decline in temperatures between the jumps to greater heat. Climate change is not at all like the smooth civil engineering of a major highway that climbs uninterruptedly up a mountain pass, but more like the mountain itself a concatenation of slopes, valleys, flat meadows, rock steps, and precipices. Oh, boy. Simply, now, now he's looking ab about uh, the need to cut back fossil fuels. Simply cutting back fossil fuel burning energy use and the destruction of natural forests will not be a sufficient answer to global heating, not least because it seems that climate change can happen faster than we can respond to it and it may be irreversible. Consider this, the Kyoto Agreement was made more than 10 years ago, now more than 15 years ago, and it seems that we have done little more to halt climate change since then, since then other than offer almost empty gestures because of the rapidity of the Earth's change, we will need to respond more like the inhabitants of a city threatened by a flood. When they see the unstoppable rise of water, their only option is to escape to higher ground. It is too late for them to do anything else as it is too late for us to try to save our familiar world. Where we now differ from all that came before is that we escaped the causes of early death, predation, famine, and disease, the things that once most frightened us. Now we have multiplied and expanded our cities and so filled them that we overfill the earth and make Malthus's nightmare real. Despite our greatly increased capacity to sustain ourselves, 
the natural world outside our farms in, and cities is not there as decoration, but serves to regulate the chemistry and climate of the earth and the ecosystems are the organs of Gaia that enable her to maintain our habitable planet. That's Gaia theory in a nutshell. Okay, <clears throat> and, he, and he keeps talking about the lifeboats uh, of the world. Uh, as I say, I need us to sit down and read the whole damn book. You guys need to get this book. The human world of the lifeboat islands and continental oases where we're going to have to run and hide in the 21st century will be constrained by limited food, energy, and living space. The ethics of a lifeboat world, this is what uh, Michael Rupert was talking about before killing himself, the ethics of a lifeboat world where the imperative is survival are entirely different from those of the cozy self-indulgent of the latter part of the 20th century. I cannot help wondering how we will manage how those of us who live on the more desirable parts of the earth will decide whom among the thirsty will be allowed to enter. Several stories this morning on my End Times rant about sub-Saharan the African climate refugees trying to get their black asses into Europe to save themselves. We in the UK have little land left to farm and feed ourselves today, but we and the refugees may in any case not be able to do so because the vast majority of us are urban, caring little for the world outside the city and not understanding that all our lives depend upon it depend upon it. The high-sounding and well-meaning visions of the European Union of saving the planet and developing sustainably by using only natural energy might have worked back in 1800 when there were only a billion of us, but now they are a wholly impractical luxury we can ill afford. Indeed, in its way, the environmentalist ideology that now seems to inspire Northern Europe and the United States may be, in the end, as damaging to the real environment as were the previous humanist ideologies. If governments persist in forcing through impractical and expensive renewable energy schemes, we will soon discover that much of the countryside has become the site for fields planted with biofuel crops, biogas generators, and industrial size wind farms. All this when land is wholly needed to grow food and more importantly to sustain a habitable climate and chemical composition. Don't feel guilty about opting out of this nonsense. Closer examination reveals it as an elaborate scam in the interest of a few nations whose economies are enriched in the short term by the sale of wind turbines, biofuel plants, and other green-sounding energy equipment. Don't for one moment believe the sales talk that these will save this planet. The salesman's 
pitches refer to the world they know, the urban world. The real earth does not need saving. It can, will, and always has saved itself, and it is now starting to do so again by changing to a state much less favorable for us. What, me, what people mean by the plea is save the planet as we know it. And that is now impossible. You tell them, old man. Okay, the disastrous mistake of 20th century science was to assume that all we need to know about the climate can come from modeling the physics and chemistry of the air in ever more powerful compu computers and then assuming that the biosphere merely responds passively to change instead of realizing that it, meaning Gaia, is in the driver's seat. Uh, okay, I, as I say guys, I could just sit down here and read this whole book. Alright, you can imagine uh, that this guy has pissed off a lot of, a lot of those greeny environmentalists. Uh, James Lovelock is not a friend of the mainstream environmental movement. The most frequent response from my environmentalist friends to the grim message in my last book, The Revenge of Gaia, was, You can't say things like that! It gives us nothing to hope for. This was a good criticism, which helped to clear my mind and let me understand why messengers are said to have a short lifespan. I realized that I had said much about the imminent catastrophe, but too little about how we could try to ensure our continued presence on Earth, giving our descendants a chance in the hot world that soon may come. We are the intelligent elite among animal life on Earth. Yeah, right. Okay. So, when I am warned that my pessimism discourages those who would improve their carbon footprint or do good works such as planting trees, I am afraid I see such efforts as at best romantic nonsense or at worst hypocrisy. And uh, he, he goes on there from there <coughs> continuing to piss off the greenies. It is time to wake up and realize that Gaia, Mother Earth, is no cozy mother. Here on Mother's Day, it is time to wake up and realize that Mother Gaia is no cozy mother that nurtures humans and can be propitiated by gestures such as carbon trading or sustainable development. Gaia, even though we are a part of her, will always dictate the terms. Yes, she will. She is dictating the terms right now in the middle of this rant as I get ready to die of heat stroke on May 11th. We have enjoyed 12,000 years of climate peace since the last shift from the glacial age to an interglacial long, to an interglacial one. Before long, we may face planet 
wide devastation worse even than unrestricted nuclear war between global superpowers. The climate war could kill nearly all of us and leave the few survivors among us living a Stone Age existence. Yep, and uh, I'm going to finish out part one here. Then I got to get back to the shade, guys, because I am dying and my camera is melting. I suspect that we worry less about global heating than about a global economic crash and forget that we could make both events happen together if we implemented an immediate global 60% reduction of fossil fuel emissions. I love it, talking about how we're going to kill ourselves if we stop fossil fuels. This would cause a this would cause a rapid fall in fossil fuel consumption and most of the particles that make the atmospheric atmospheric aerosol would within weeks fall from the air. This would greatly simplify prediction and we could at last be fairly sure that global temperatures would rise. The removal of the pollution aerosol from burning fossil fuels would leave the gaseous greenhouse unobstructed and free at last to devastate what was left of the comfortable interglacial earth. Yes, if we implemented in full the recommendations uh, of, of reducing fossil fuel uh, emissions by 60 uh, percent Far from stabilizing the climate, it would, at first anyway, grow hotter, not cooler. This is why I said in The Revenge of Gaia, we live in a fool's climate and we are damned whatever we do. And uh, one more a uh, paragraph to wrap up this rant, then I will pick up uh, part two from my shady chair. <clears throat> At this point, I feel that a more general observation about climate change is needed. Yes, uh, I, I would say so. If we stand back and consider all the other perturbations possible to our self-regulating Earth, we see that the presence of seven billion people aiming for first world comforts is too much. It is clearly, meaning seven billion people, is clearly incompatible with the homeostasis of our climate but also clearly incompatible with chemistry, biological diversity, and the economy of the entire system. Instability in any of these other properties of the Earth is potentially as devastating as climate change and inter acts with it. The acidification of the oceans is just one single example of this multiplex pathology caused by an excess of affluent humans. There you go and uh, I am going to pick up uh, this two-part ser Doomsday Sermon with Chapter 3, Consequences and Survival. But since I am worried about my own survival and the survival of my little Made in China plastic camera, 
I need to get off of my rocky doomsday pulpit here on Mother's Day as we uh, chronicle the death of our mother on Mother's Day, head back to my little comfortable chair in the shade for part two of this sermon. This will bring me to the end of part one. Amen, Brother James Lovelock, the vanishing face of Gaia, a final warning. Be back at you in a minute.